and uh, so I was told there was this photograph, and I hunted, and I hunted, and I hunted, and then I finally contacted a guy who edits a jazz magazine. He said, it doesn't exist. You're going to get the simple truth. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, this takes place in Fresno, but in it, the woman I meet reminds me of my growing up in Detroit. And she talks like the people I knew in Detroit, and she dresses like the people I knew in Detroit. And she lies like the people I knew in Detroit. The simple truth. The Henry, by the way, who comes in later is, 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 is the first name of the poet who is a dear friend of mine. The simple truth. I bought a dollar and a half's worth of small red potatoes, took them home, boiled them in their jackets, and ate them for dinner with a little butter and salt. Then I walked through the dried fields on the edge of town. In middle June, the light hung on in the dark furrows at my feet, and in the mountain oaks overhead, the birds were gathering for the night, the jays and mockers stalking back and forth, the finches still darting into the dusty light. The woman who sold me the potatoes was from Poland. She was someone out of my childhood, in a pink spangled sweater and sunglasses, praising the perfection of all her fruits and vegetables at the roadside stand, and urging me to taste even the pale, raw sweet corn, trucked all the way, she swore, from New Jersey. Eat, eat, she said. Even if you don't, I'll say you did. Some things you know all your life. They are so simple and true, they must be said without elegance, meter, and rhyme. They must be laid on the table beside the salt shaker, the glass of water, the absence of light gathering in the shadows of the picture frames. They must be naked and alone. They must stand for themselves. My friend Henry and I, arrived at this together in 1963, before I went away, before he began to kill himself and the two of us to betray our love. Can you taste what I'm saying? It is onions or potatoes, a pinch of simple salt, the wealth of melting butter. It is obvious. It stays in the back of your throat like a truth you never uttered because the time was always wrong. It stays there for the rest of your life, unspoken, made of that dirt we call earth, the metal we call salt, in a form we have no words for, and you live on it. There isn't much to say about starlight, I don't think. Mm -hmm. um, What, what would one have to know? I guess a lot of the emotion for the poem comes from the fact that my father doesn't live very long after this. Starlight. My father stands in the warm evening on the porch of my first house. I'm four years old and growing tired. I see his head among the stars, the glow of his cigarette, redder than the summer moon riding low over the old neighborhood. We are alone. And he asks me if I am happy. Are you happy? I cannot answer. I do not really understand the word. And the voice, my father's voice, is not his voice, but somehow thick and choked. A voice I have not heard before, but heard often since. He bends and passes a thumb beneath each, each of my eyes. The cigarette is gone, but I can smell the tiredness that hangs on his breath. He has found nothing. And he smiles and holds my head with both his hands. Then he lifts me to his shoulder. And now I too am there among the stars, as tall as he. Are you happy, I say? He nods in answer, yes, oh yes, oh yes. 
And in that new voice, he says nothing, holding my head tight against his head, his eyes closed up against the starlight, as though those tiny blinking eyes of light might find a tall, gaunt child holding his child against the promises of autumn until the boy slept, never to waken in that world again. Ford Highland Park is, is, was once the second largest Ford plant, and now it's just a huge warehouse in Detroit. And there was a period in my life when I didn't see my twin brother very often, but I would see his face in other men and really believe it was, that's who I was looking at. And I would, I would sort of get up very close. My eyesight isn't terrific. And I would see it, it isn't him. And I guess I was just searching to see him. We were separate. I was living in a different town. What work is? We stand in the rain in a long line, waiting at Ford Highland Park for work. You know what work is. If you're old enough to read this, you know what work is, although you may not do it. Forget you. This is about waiting, shifting from one foot to another, feeling the light rain falling like mist into your hair, blurring your vision, until you think you see your own brother ahead of you, maybe 10 places. You rub your glasses with your fingers, and of course, it's someone else's brother, narrower across the shoulders than yours, but with the same sad slouch, the grin that does not hide the stubbornness, the sad refusal to give in to rain, to the hours wasted waiting, to the knowledge that somewhere ahead, a man is waiting who will say, no, we're not hiring today for any reason he wants. You love your brother. Now suddenly you can hardly stand the love flooding you for your brother, who's not beside you or behind or ahead, because he's home, trying to sleep off a miserable night shift at Cadillac, so he can get up before noon to study his German. Works eight hours a night, so he can sing Wagner the opera you hate most, the worst music ever invented. How long has it been since you told him you loved him, held his wide shoulders, opened your eyes wide, and said those words, and maybe kissed his cheek? You've never done something so simple, so obvious, not because you're too young or too dumb, not because you're jealous or even mean, or incapable of crying in the presence of another man. No, just because you don't know what work is. Well, the plane arrived a little late, didn't it? <laughs> Every blessed day. First with a glass of water tasting of iron, and then with more and colder water over his head, he gasps himself awake. He hears the cheek of winter birds searching the snow for crumbs of garbage and knows exactly how much light and how much darkness is there before the dawn, gray and weak, slips between the buildings. Closing the door behind him, he thinks of places he has never seen but heard about, of the great desert his father said was like no sea he had ever crossed, and how at dusk or dawn it held all the shades of red and blue in its merging shadows. And though his life was then a prison, he had come to live for these suspended moments. Waiting at the corner, he feels the cold at his back and stamps himself awake again. Seven miles from the frozen narrow river, even before he looks, he knows the faces on the bus, some going to work and some coming back, but each sealed in its hunger for a different life, a lost life. 
where he's going or who he is, he doesn't ask himself. He doesn't know and doesn't know it matters. He gets off at the familiar corner, crosses the emptying parking lots toward Chevy gear and axle number three. In a few minutes, he will hold his time card above a clock and he can drop it in and hear the moment crunching down or he cannot. For either way, the day will last forever. So he lets it fall. If he feels the elusive calm his father spoke of and searched for all his short life, there's no way of telling. For now he's laughing among them, older men and kids. He's saying, damn, we've got it made. He's lighting up or chewing with the others, thousands of miles from their forgotten homes, each and every one his father's son. No airplane. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. The car, it's, it's amazing. I think I read it just as well. <clears throat> the Mercy. Uh, the library here is the famous library on 42nd Street in Manhattan. The Mercy. The ship that took my mother to Ellis Island 83 years ago was named the Mercy. She remembers trying to eat a banana without first peeling it and seeing her first orange in the hands of a young Scot, a seaman, who gave her a bite and wiped her mouth for her with a red bandana and taught her the word, orange, saying it patiently over and over. A long autumn voyage, the days darkening with the black waters calming as night came on, then nothing as far as her eyes could see, in space, without limit, rushing off to the corners of creation. She prayed in Russian and Yiddish to find her family in New York, prayers unheard or misunderstood, or perhaps ignored by all the powers that swept the waves of darkness before she woke, that kept the mercy afloat while smallpox raged among the passengers and crew, until the dead were buried at sea with strange prayers in a tongue she could not fathom. The Mercy. I read on the yellowing pages of a book I located in, win in a windowless room of the library on 42nd Street, sat 31 days offshore in quarantine before the passengers disembarked. There a story ends. Other ships arrived. Tancred out of Glasgow. The Neptune registered as Danish. Umberto IV. The list goes on for pages. November gives way to winter. The sea pounds this alien shore. Italian miners from Piemonte dig under towns in western Pennsylvania, only to rediscover the same nightmare. They left it home. A nine-year-old girl travels all night by train with one suitcase and an orange. She learns that mercy is something you can eat again and again while the juice spills over your chin. You can wipe it away with the back of your hands and you can never get enough. Don't worry about... No, it's not that. <laughs> oh, oh, good. I'd hate to sit in front of a camera. Yeah, well, I'm, I, I'm not sitting in front of a camera. I'm sitting in front of two people. Oh, good for you. Yeah, that's it. Good for you and Sonny here. Sonny. Uh, yes, and Sonny. Yes, <laughs> my Japanese friend.